I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and I have a very special guest today in honor of SIF's Noir series, Noir City, I believe it's called. Uh, it is. We've got the master of noir, Eddie Muller, here. Um, Eddie is kind enough to give us some insight into the films in the series. We're not going to cover them all because there's so many to talk about, but we're going to try and hit on a few for those of you who are going to be attending the series. The first film I wanted to talk about, though, was Gilda. Uh, Gilda is from director Charles Vitter. You know, it's the story of, let's see, um, a sinister boss of a South American casino that finds his right-hand man, Johnny, and his sensuous wife, Gilda, already know each other. <laughs> Just on the surface, that sounds like pretty much a perfect noir storyline. Like, <laughs> that seems like when I think film noir, that's kind of the stuff I think of. Well, yeah. Uh, it, the thing that people need to realize about Gilda and what makes it so special as a film is, well, number one, it was created specifically for Rita Hayworth mm. as a starring vehicle. But... It's a very, very weirdly subversive film because it um, so wants to violate the production code <laughs> that Hollywood had in place at the time uh, that it, it's a really unusual film for people to watch today because so much of what's actually happening in the mm. film is couched in this sort of repressed, uh, you know, the. It, the, the movie is about sex. That's all it's about. Really. Yeah, I mean, and with Rita Hayworth. It's Oof. so repressed that the relationship between Johnny and Gilda and then between Balin, whom she marries, the, the rich South American gangster casino owner that she marries, um, there's this very strange sexual dynamic that goes on mm -hmm. in that film. And, you know, I... I know this to be true, so I say this kind of stuff. And some people, even today, they say, no, that's not what that movie's really about. But I think people should come out to the theater, watch the film, and judge for themselves. Because I will tell you that that is uh, a film of rampant bisexuality. It's, a, it's pretty extraordinary. And the symbolism that's used in the film to delineate that is masterful. It is. It's so weird. There are so many, uh, you know, swords within canes and <laughs> cigarette holders and all of this stuff being deployed as sexual symbols. Mm. Uh, it, it's a pretty remarkable film. And I mean, you got it. You, as you noted, Rita Hayworth. This is like of her filmography, this is to be one of the most notable films she was in. I mean, she famous... This is her most famous role. She, she, I mean, she famously said, like, you know, when she goes to bed with people, they go to bed with Gilda and they wake up with Rita. Yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's such a profound thing to think about that she became Gilda to a lot of people. I mean... Absolutely. She never stopped being Gilda to people. And it, it totally contaminated all of her relationships with men, including Orson Welles, whom she was married mm -hmm. to for a while. They made Lady from Shanghai together. But yes, that was the tragedy of her life, actually, was that she could never live down being this... You know what they called at the time the Hollywood love goddess, mm -hmm. and Gilda is the role that made her that. And uh, on the, so, on the one hand, it's absolutely fascinating to watch a movie like this and see how someone, how a mere mortal, becomes this incredible uh, icon of the cinema, yeah. and and yet. There is this human aspect to mm -hmm. it uh, when you and I know people who who knew Rita Hayworth and they've told me like how sad she was mm -hmm. you know and and she became a very serious alcoholic and uh, you know developed Alzheimer's when she was in her early sixties. Wow, that's, and, that's tragic. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a sad story, but when you watch her on screen. Pretty amazing. She is absolutely extraordinary, and it's like you get it. It's like, man, this is, uh, you know, the most gorgeous woman 
that you've ever seen on a movie screen. And, and also interesting to note that uh, you know she's Mexican. Really? <laughs> and it's it's yeah. See, that's I, I would have guessed that. Yeah. Because uh, Margarita Cancino, and they had to you know take away her ethnicity to make her this huge star in Hollywood. Mm. They did electrolysis to you know to raise her hairline because she just she looked a little too Hispanic. Interesting. And when you see her early movies, you can you can see clearly that you know she is Hispanic, and they converted her into this. You know, she was a redhead. They. It's funny. I mean, she made black and white movies, but they always called her a redhead. Right. Until they finally shot her in color, and they actually colored her hair to make her even more of a redhead than she actually was. But it's kind of fascinating that you know one of the great Hollywood sex symbols of all time is from Mexico and Doesn't get Holly, credit, Hollywood yeah. never Acknowledge revealed that, yeah. that that was the reality. That's funny. Uh, another one I want to talk about uh, films that are playing this week is Laura from uh, director Otto Preminger. You know, he famously did like Bunny Lake is Missing and Anatomy of a Murder, but Laura definitely seems to hold a place in terms of the hearts of noir fans around the world. I know a lot of people think this is the best noir film ever. You know, what is what is your sort of sense of the film Laura? Well, it's interesting because I think it's a great film. There are people who also that I know who say, well, you know, that's not really noir. I don't know why they mm. think that. Um, because it was part of a, a group of films that came out in 1944 that sort of defined the beginning of the whole movement mm -hmm. in Hollywood. There was Double Indemnity and Phantom Lady and Murder My Sweet. Yeah, wow, 1944 Laura, was a they, great they year. They all came out that year. Woman in the Window was another one. And, and that was kind of the, I'm not going to say it was the high water mark, but it was definitely when, when the floodgates opened, so to speak. Uh, the thing that makes Laura really interesting to me, and it's funny, I put this on a double bill with Gilda, mm -hmm, because yeah. the two films have a lot in common. There's there's a very uh, unspoken but perverse sexual element to both of these films. I can see that, yeah. And uh, Laura, in particular, is, is just a really bizarre movie because it's about uh, a detective... Uh, a police detective who falls in love with the victim of a crime. Yeah, a murder victim. And falls in love with the murder victim and does, and needs to know what happened to her because he actually is in love with her. And, you know, I don't want to spoil the plot, right. but all of the people around her are very, very strange. And all of the suspects in the crime are a very indeterminate Sexuality and even even just the general idea of falling in love with a dead woman yep. has got all sorts of connotations and there's a whole like, necrophilia yeah exactly thing yeah. This yeah. Film yeah that is like this is 1944 yeah that's pretty wild to think and it about. is I mean when Clifton Webb says to Dana Andrews you know they're gonna they're going to put you in the ward McPherson I don't think they've ever seen someone in love with a corpse before it's like. It's weird. It's like there, there's a there's a very very subtle, um, almost horror film yeah. undercurrent to Laura that's that's really kind of fascinating. It is an appropriate billing with Gilda because, as you said, like there's all sorts of themes in that one that were sort of skirting the the code, the film code, oh, yeah. and there's definitely some in here as well. I mean, there's a thing about noir that makes it so interesting and has kept it so fresh for so many years. And that has to do with the tension you find in these films because they wanted to tell adult stories. They wanted, the writers in particular, wanted to uh, sort of push against that code and say, you know, there's all kinds of interesting aspects of human behavior that we're not supposed to talk about in these movies. So noir is where they found ways to do it within the confines of the production code. And to me, personally, it's it's what I find most enjoyable about these movies time and time again, mm. is that there was a way to discuss 
perversion. There's a way to discuss lust and greed and the seven deadly sins and all of that stuff that was still tasteful and restrained, but but just as potent in some in some respects more potent. Mm-hmm. than if you just came right out and showed it or talked about it blatantly. I, I think that's a, sort of a general thing in life, too, though. I think it's easier for people to digest an idea if you sort of give it to them in smaller doses that are not just, like, stuffed down their throat. I feel like, you know... Um, in politics, a lot of times when people sort of throw out these grand ideas, people are initially resistant to them. But if you of course, sort of, yeah. if you yeah. sort of slowly be like, okay, look at this movie, you know, we're showing you some stuff, like you know, yeah. and oh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And and it, it's very interesting to me because, well, exactly as you say, they can't just come right out and and shatter the production code. They've got to do it in incremental ways. And I found that it made for very innovative filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the first film that we're showing in the series, uh, Thieves Highway, is is another film that defies the production code because there's a the female lead in the film, Valentina Corteza, plays a prostitute. But it's never said in the film that she Mm. is a prostitute. Mm -hmm. But you sort of have to figure that out and there's a scene in the in the movie where she invites Richard Conti up to her crib basically I mean this is where she works you know and and you sort of have to read between the lines but then they just they decided we want to have a scene that shows the the sexuality Mm -hmm. between these two people but there's nothing we can really do you know, because the code dictated, you know, they can't sit on the bed together. Right. The guy has to have his foot on the floor at all times. <laughs> the woman can't remove any of her clothing or all this stuff. And what they what they did is they figured out, well, there's no rule in the production code that says that the guy can't take off an article of clothing. <laughs> so they have Richard Conti take a shower. And you can hear him taking the shower, but they show her listening to him taking the shower. Which is really kind of sexy. Yeah. And then when he comes out of the shower, they play tic tac toe on his chest. Mm-hmm. And there's like nothing in the production code that says, <laughs> "Oh, you can't do that." You know, that's and it's just like it's amazing. It's, it's like the sexiest thing yeah. in a Hollywood movie of that time. Yeah. And, but, and I, I, that's what I love about film noir mm. is that it, it it made people really be creative and inventive. No, I absolutely agree about that. And one of the more interesting and creative people that are part of the series is uh, Preston Sturgis and Unfaithfully Yours. Yeah. Uh, you talked about it before, you know, people critiquing Laura for not being a film noir. <laughs> you could certainly argue that with uh, Unfaithfully Yours as well, because it's just, you know the story of a conductor who imagines you know different scenarios for killing his wife. And yeah, it is, it's a comedy, and yet it's it's sort of one of the, those things like if you're so focused on classifying a film as one genre, then maybe perhaps, you know, I, you might call it comedy or over film noir. I don't know. You could argue either way. But to me, it's, a, it's absolutely a comedy, but it's a comedy that would not have existed were it not for the film noir movement mm-hmm. in Hollywood. The, the reality of this is that Sturgis wrote this idea in the 1930s. He, it was one of the first ideas he had when he was in Hollywood, he went working as a writer. And he decided, you know, this is an idea that I really want to explore. And it was the flash forward concept where the guy's conducting the orchestra and he's devising all of these schemes to get rid of his wife. But the studios all balked at it. They said, this is too weird and mean spirited and I, we don't really think this is funny. And then by the time 1948 rolled around, mm. Every studio was making movies about husbands trying to kill their wives, wives trying to kill their husbands. That's kind of the stock and trade of noir, right? And so they said, well, okay, I, I guess now what you're doing is a parody of all these other movies that are being made in all the studios. And so that then Sturgis got the okay to make this film. And it's, it's really, really a creative Yeah, movie. no, absolutely. Uh, it has, you know, a fragmented narrative and it... it and it's very mean spirited. It's a very, it, it's outrageously funny, but there's something really venomous about the comedy in that movie 
uh, that I, when I showed it, you know, I, I didn't apologize for showing a comedy in a film noir series, but I definitely said, even though you're going to laugh your ass off watching this film, you will find that this is one of the meanest movies in the series. Well, I mean, it sort of goes back to that uh, discussion you were saying about, you know, the way film noir sort of introduces concepts and sort of like on the surface you're right it's a very funny film but it's one of those things you know the more you think about it the more you realize how dark it actually is oh it's it's uh, there's no two ways about it i mean it's a movie about a guy plotting to murder his wife that's what the movie's about i mean it's not a yeah. quote unquote funny premise <laughs> yeah <laughs> but in preston sturgis's hands it it really it, it's it's an amazing uh, feat of writing and directing because he exposes the absurdity at the core of the most venal type of human behavior, which I, I find very, very admirable. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's amazing to see, you know, a guy so with so much of the control in this. I mean, as the director, the writer, the producer, I mean, this was his vision being executed. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, you know, on the same note, there's another one that had the same sort of premise, which was uh, Hugo Haas's pickup. I mean, Hugo Haas was what, the director, the writer, the producer, and the star yes. of that film, which is a story about, you know, boy meets girl, boy has accident, <laughs> girl starts to, you know, get involved with the boy's friend, boy becomes aware of the relationship, and they're well, going to... And the, the crucial thing is that the man goes deaf. Yes. That's, that's the crucial part of the plot. So that his wife doesn't think that he can hear anything that she's saying right. to her lover. And then he has a second accident and doesn't let on that, that it he can, actually yeah. <laughs> cures his deafness. But that, that means, I, I mean, I don't know of all of... It's a great premise. It's like a... It's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it seems like something that would be coming out now, actually. Like, in a lot of ways, I could see that film coming out today and being like, I totally could see that. Well, Hugo Haas was way ahead of his time. I'm not going to... I will not argue that he was a great filmmaker, but he was a very resourceful, inventive, and entertaining Filmmaker, and in some cases, I will take those three things over great. Yeah, and he's and you talk about like taking a lot on. Like he was the star of the movie too. Like I mean, I don't know across the entire history of film noir how many directors were the stars of their film as well. Orson I mean, Wells. I mean, that's yeah, that's, that's like it. You know, <laughs> that's a pretty that's elite pretty class to be in. To be yeah. like, yeah. Uh, I, do you know the Hugo Haas story? Like his background. I, I heard he was he came from Europe. He was an he, immigrant. He was Czechoslovakian. And, and yes, he came to America with the rise of the Nazis. He was a very distinguished uh, theater actor and director in Czechoslovakia. And he did not, you know, want to stick around in Europe when the Nazis took charge. And he, Wise came, decision. To, he came to the United States and was very, very disheartened that in Hollywood, because he had the accent and he, and he looked Eastern European, that his lot in Hollywood was to play Nazis. Yeah, that's you know? kind of... And it was insulting to him, because that was the last thing he wanted to do. Yeah. Right? And so he scraped together a bare-bones budget and said, you know, I'm going to make my own films. I have enough talent to do my own thing. And he started making, in the 50s, these low-budget movies, most of them distributed by 20th Century Fox, that were all sort of remakes of The Blue Angel. Where Interesting. He, where, and he was the star playing a middle-aged schlub who falls in love with these young, hot babes who all betray <laughs> him and try to steal his money and try to kill him. Yeah. And he made like seven or eight of these films, and it's all basically the same movie, mm. but every one of them made money. Wow. You know, and they didn't cost a lot to make. So he really, you know, so on the one hand, you have people in Hollywood and the critics who were merciless to Hugo Haas saying, this is junk and blah, 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 which hurt him deeply because he was a, a pretty distinguished, you know, producer, director in his homeland. But here, all he could do was this low budget stuff. And he understood the system. He said, if I try to make something grandiose, they're going to, they're going to kill me because I'm not an American. Like, who does this guy think he is? But they let him make these small movies, and the movies all made money. He kept making the films. He, he made a 
good living. He had total creative control of his films. And it was just like, all I have to do is absorb the punishment I get from the critics who just look down on me. It's so interesting because like that in some ways parallels in my mind someone, you know, like Kevin Smith, somebody who really understands their audience they're able to really embrace and work with that audience. You know, the rest of the studios and the critics and whatever don't understand him, but because of things, you know, like you think about Kevin Smith or somebody now with Twitter and websites and stuff, I imagine somebody yeah. like Hugo Haas could have done a Absolutely. ton being able to embrace Absolutely. his audience because it sounds like he really, uh, he knew what his audience want. He was doing what he, he wanted. He knew exactly. Uh, and, and has a very interesting niche in Hollywood mm -hmm. history that really hasn't been explored. No, and at, at some point, someone will present a complete Hugo Haas retrospective. Yeah. Because fortunately, um, you know, Fox is very good about taking care of their films, and he also made pictures for Columbia, which is mm. now owned by Sony, and Sony is very good mm -hmm. about maintaining and preserving their films. That's cool. So the Hugo Haas films are not lost. They're actually out there and you can see them. Some of them have come out on DVD. I think more will come out. And you can still get them on 35 millimeter. Hmm. And I mean, the, the, the one drawback to his oeuvre is it's all the same movie. Right. <laughs> you know? well, I mean, so it's well done, you know. Back to back to back to back. It's like, haven't I seen this yeah. last night? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I can appreciate when they come that. Out once a year, it's different it's than exactly. seeing them get back consecutive back. days. Uh, the last film I wanted to talk about now was a film called Underworld USA, and I haven't I haven't seen this film, but I was fascinated by it. Reading the description, it's about you a you haven't seen the film. No, oh. but the, the, well, the, I'll tell you why. This is fascinating to me. In store. This, uh, it's about a 14-year-old girl who sees her no, father. 14-year-old boy. It's four, sorry, 14-year-old boy who has a uh, father beaten to death, and 20 years later, he basically comes back to get revenge. Yes. In essence, it struck me as a film noir version of Batman. I was like, this is amazing. Uh, you know, you're the first person <laughs> I've ever heard say that, but that is kind of what it's Yeah, like, it, sounds, you know? it sounds amazing. Uh, and... It's interesting that you pick these films to, to focus on that all, like Unfaithfully Yours, Pick Up, and Underworld USA are all the works of writer, producer, director. Mm -hmm. You know, because Sam Fuller, yeah. Underworld USA, is to my mind like the great example of an independent. Yeah, he filmmaker. definitely had a long career. Uh, you know, he is the genius that Hugo Haas wishes he was right. in a way. Uh, but yeah, Underworld USA, it is like a classic revenge saga. Uh, and it's just a fascinating, it's a beautifully made film. I, I mean, Sam Fuller, to, to my mind, is one of the great American stories of mm. the last century. Uh, of all American artists of the 20th century, he is the man that I actually admire the most. Wow. Uh, I'm glad I ended on this one. Yeah, not, not, <laughs> not just because I like his movies so much, but just because I admire his life so mm. much. Because um, my family has a newspaper background, and Sam Fuller was a newspaper man uh -huh. immediately from, the, from his teens in New York, and he had an incredible uh, life as a newspaper reporter. He was, the, he was America's youngest crime reporter when he was wow. 17 years old. He was covering major crime stories in New York. Wow. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the actress Jean Eagles. She was a silent film star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was like one of the first celebrity casualties of a drug overdose. Uh -huh. Sam Fuller is the guy who discovered her body. Wow. That's and and didn't report it to the police so that he could get the Excuse. scoop for his newspaper. <laughs> That's, that's our. That's, yeah, that's like you know? tabloid journalism and then before once he tabloid filed journalism. The story, then he called it in. Wow, police, that's you know? that's crazy. And and he had an amazing. Uh, he was with the first infantry division in World War II, and uh, landed on the beach at Normandy. And wow. was the, not only did he survive the landing at Normandy, he was the only American soldier to actually run the beach at Normandy twice. That's survived because he he made it up the beach. And then the radio operator was knocked out, and they said, we have to know that we're getting radio communication through. And Fuller ran back 
to make sure that the radio <laughs> thing got through That's and amazing. then made it back up the beach again. I mean, absolutely like a million to one shot that he would survive that, and he did. And then he went on to become like one of the greatest independent yeah. filmmakers ever. This is all after these yeah, that's two amazing. other complete life stories that he lived. Seriously. Uh, yeah, he is an extraordinary character. So I, I always, uh, I will always take time to pay tribute to Sam. Very good. I, I definitely look forward to checking out Underworld USA. Yeah, you, you got to see that one. It, it, it's a pretty amazing film. When, when Fuller did violence, it was, it was exceptional. It wasn't graphic. But it was brutal. <laughs> and there's, there's stuff in Underworld USA that's just jaw-dropping. I think that's usually the best way to do pretty much anything is sort of to imply something or work around it and not go, like, straight for You know, violence, to sort of imply violence instead of just graphically show it. Sort of like, you know, horror films imply, you know, somebody's being stalked instead of just, like, brutally massacring someone. I feel like those are the times that the imagination Letting people's imagination works is usually the best thing you can do. I, I couldn't agree more. And the thing that film noir does, I mean, you realize that film noir is all about people acting on their worst instincts. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of what all these movies are yeah. about, right? But the way they're made, they're very seductive. And they, the style is to draw the audience mm -hmm. in. It's like, we're going to make you empathize with these people, right? <laughs> The, it, the movies don't repel you. No, definitely not. They they seduce you, you know, and it's it's really interesting, and it's a lesson that I think more filmmakers today should learn. But I think that the society today, this is an interesting point. I I think that when people get the power to make a film today, there is. Uh, kind of a screw you attitude that a lot of filmmakers mm. develop mm -hmm. which is like that. I have the power to do this and now you're going to take it whether you like it or not I'm going to show you this and I'm going to rub your nose in it and I can't figure out what, mm. the, what the ultimate value of that is mm -hmm. right of being so graphic and, and being so distasteful and repugnant on film I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't I can see, Yeah, I can definitely you know? see that. So you're hosting all the screening, all the evening screenings at SIF's Noir series, Noir City, yeah. um, which you can find at SIF.net. Do you have a website or Twitter okay. or anything else that oh. people can follow well, what you're I, up to? I, to? I don't Twitter yet. Or I don't blame ever, you. ever, I don't know. It's a... I'm a holdout, man. I don't, I don't blame you. I have you. a Facebook page. Okay, that's now. good, too. Uh, but yes, I have my own website, which is uh, eddiemuller.com. I'm going to leave off the www. I'll, I'll be Muller. sure to put it down com. here. Yeah, okay. And then uh, the, the Noir City Festivals, and there is a Noir City website as well, N-O-I-R-C-I-T-Y. Uh, and then there's the Film Noir Foundation mm. dot org which is the nonprofit foundation that I created that actually oh, okay. rescues and restores yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, noir films. That's fantastic. Uh, that's a, something we don't even have time maybe to get into, but I got to tell you, it's a huge issue. Yeah. Trying to preserve old films as films in the teeth of the digital revolution is... You know, it is becoming a more difficult. Oh, absolutely! Task all the time, because I I gave a talk here last night in Seattle about how digital is not a preservation medium, because mm -hmm. people are confusing the ease with which digital can be reproduced. Right? You mm -hmm. just throw it in there and burn me another one. You know, they're confusing that with preservation which is how long will that disc actually last? And yeah. they're, they're tricking you into thinking, all you have to do is just burn another one and then burn another one. But what they're not realizing is it's not a preservation medium because the technology will continue to change. And you're gonna have to change, if you have a film, right, like a, like a real 4K, you know, restored version of a film, and you wanna preserve that, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, it, you're going to have to migrate that to a different mm. piece of equipment, you know, no, hardware totally. every time. Because eventually, 
they're they're changing the method by which you output that information because mm -hmm. it's just yeah. zeros and ones, right? Yeah. That's all it True. is in the digital package. So if you have a film, it's light through film. That's it. It's pretty straightforward. Right? It's pretty straightforward, man. If you have the film as film, you can digitize it tomorrow. You can digitize it a hundred years from now mm. with whatever the medium is at that time. But if you lose the film and all you have is the digital version, you could be in serious trouble yeah. trying to someday say, oh, we want to show this. Well, you know, that's five generations ago that we stored that thing digitally. Mm -hmm. Now we don't have the ability to get it out of that drive. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's a, it's a major problem. I, I think it's a good cause, and I love places like the Grand Illusion that we have in Seattle that yeah, actually shows yeah. 35 millimeter yeah, films. And I know stuff. It's, it's it's great. Seattle's a good film town. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Eddie. I hope uh, you have good luck with the Noir City series thank and the foundation. You, um, so you can find more interviews at MacGuffinPodcast.com, and we'll see you later. Can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This tech don't even try to buy the same style. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. I'm on f